speaker is Anthony Montgomery. Tony has been an aquatic biologist for the Department of Land and Natural Resources, Division of Aquatic Resources since 2003. He has conducted research on black coral since 1995 and has used advanced diving techniques to access black coral habitats. He also works extensively on invasive species issues and today he'll be discussing um, black coral fishery. Well, good morning, and um, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, The Hawaiian Black Coral Fishery uh, Science and Management. Uh, the, the, the title Science and Management may sound a little cliche, but I think this is one fishery that uh, you, it's actually a tremendous amount of science on such a small, um, very discreet, uh, um, uh, uh, small fishery. And um, there's been a lot of work between both state and federal agencies uh, to tr try to work on this fishery. So let me um, first just thank my co-authors, uh, Ivor Williams and Jason Leonard. Ivor's been tremendous in helping us some of the data analysis, and uh, Jason, uh, tremendous in the field. With that, I just want to start off with some of the other acknowledgments. Um, you know, Frank Parrish and Ray Bolin has been tremendous uh, help in the field, uh, offering ship time and, and also consultations. Uh, Dr. Grigg and Dr. K uh, Kang from the University of Hawaii, um, Josh DeMello and the Western uh, Pacific Regional Fishery Council, uh, all the DAR divers that assisted and, um, and everyone else that uh, contributed. So I just want to put those up front just to show that this is, this is a pr kind of work that takes a lot of people and a lot of support, both uh, especially in the field. Um, so just a little bit of introduction of what Anthopotherians or black coral is. Um, it's a hexacoral. Um, there are very, there are tremendous amount of taxonomic issues with this group, uh, even with the species we have here. The uh, main species, Antimathes dichotoma, is actually not dichotoma. It's going to be redescribed. That publication will probably be coming out soon. Um, there's about 15 species in Hawaii, five of which are in diving depths. Um, the fishery started in the late 1950s, and it's since acti been active since then for the jewelry trade. Um, there's been three species dominated, targeted by this fishery, one dominant, that's Antimathes dichotoma. Um, the, the species, the depth range is 20 to 110 meters, and uh, it's actually one of the only a few black coral fisheries in Hawaii, and I would um, claim that it's probably the only uh, close to sustainable uh, black coral fishery in the world. Uh, this is what the uh, dichotomy looks like in shallow water. I'm just going to show you a few uh, brief pictures so you get a, an image of what, what the, actually this organism is. Um, this is a Myriopathes ulex. This is one that's not targeted by the fishery but has been in the past. Um, these are wire corals, which are also black corals. These are not part of the fishery, but also make up a, a strong component of the habitat. Um, this is uh, Antipathes grandis. It's an endemic uh, um, coral in Hawaii. And this is a, a smaller version on the Ihau of uh, Antipathes grandis colony. And this is off of Kauai. Um, just uh, the significance of this, it's a little bit hard to see, but uh, all of that uh, habitat is covered by black coral. Um, probably the highest densities I've seen anywhere in, in the Hawaiian Islands. So historically, there have been very big colonies in this fishery, and I just want to show these slides to show that, that black corals can be huge. The, the stump that was harvested in the 70s is pictured on the right. The, um, if, if you, the, the person standing behind it, you can see that those stumps are the size of his legs. Um, this, this colony had to be huge, probably pushing a three to four meters in height. Um, and this, uh, the colony on the right is uh, taken by Dr. Grigg. Um, this was taken in the 50s. You can see it's a very, very big colony. These colonies exist, but they're very, very far a few between. This is what the colonies look like after they're harvested, but before they make it to the market. So they're actually stored sometimes for years in a, in a pasture um, waiting to, to go to market. And in the end, this is, what, uh, this is um, basically what the final product looks like uh, by Maui divers. Um, Basically, a small amount of material will feed a very large industry in the jewelry trade. So it's a very efficient uh, fishery at this point. Only a little bit of material is required to make the final product. 
So where are the black corals in Hawaii and, and what do we know about them? Well, uh, there is a, a large amount of black corals on the south of Kauai. And if you look here, you can see this is a Makawena Point. Uh, you, you'll see the, uh, the, the deeper reef there in a, um, off, off the shore. That, that's the deeper drop off where it's extremely high densities of black coral. Um, there's also a lot of black corals on the south, uh, south part of the Big Island. We know very little about this population, though. But predominantly what I'll be talking about today and where the fishery predominates since the last 30 years is uh, right here in the Owl Channel, which is the channel between Maui and Lanai. More specifically here, you can see it. I'm sorry, I don't think I have a laser pointer. But if you look at the, uh, the red ridges in that channel or the shallow, that's about 30 meters depth. And those uh, um, areas, you can see here on the right, there's a, a large sunken basin. That's an area known as stone walls. I'll, I'll touch on that later. But all this is prime habitat for black coral. So just as I go through some of the data, there's a few key numbers I want people to, uh, to keep in mind. So we, we think that the maturity is around a seven, 67 to 70, 77 centimeters in height, which is about 10 and a half to 12 years. Um, the yearly growth rate is 6.42 centimeters. The 36-inch uh, height colony is roughly a three-quarter inch base diameter, and that's 90 centimeters in height and 14 years in, in age. Apologize for all the different numbers, but because this fishery goes between standard and metric and the rules are written in standard um, and we, we measure in, in metric, we have to understand all of these numbers uh, concurrently. And then as well as the, if we go to a, a height the size above that, it's the 48-inch or one-inch base diameter. 120 centimeters in height and 19 years of age. The ages of 14 and 19 are, are the important ones to remember. So uh, early on, Dr. Grigg has studied uh, age frequency uh, distributions of the black coral population at Owl Channel, and over the course of, um, of 26 years, produced this graph that was published in 2004. Um, you can see that it, it fairly fits a good decline from lots of juveniles to very few individuals. And you can see from 1975 to 1998, that uh, there's still lots of juveniles in the population, but very few bigger colonies. Um, that would be expected in a fishery. You're going to fish down the bigger colonies, especially in this where the bigger colonies are targeted. Uh, but in 2001, using a different methodology, so the age class sizes are a little different, you can see that maybe there's a dip in the early age classes there. And that's kind of where we start to um, want to know, is there a problem here? And it was suggested in 2004 that there is an, uh, a drop in recruitment. So we set out to test that and, and look at it a little bit more scientific and say, is that sure? If, is, it, is that the, the case? Because if that's the case, we need to tighten up the regulations, make sure this fishery stays sustainable, and we need to make sure we have the right data to do so. In addition to that, around the same time frame, uh, Dr. Grigg and Dr. Kong um, found that uh, parts of the channel were covered in a, what, what is known as snowflake coral. And if you look at the two graphs here that, uh, out of Sam's work, you can see that the, the coverage of snowflake coral hits the biggest colonies. And if you look at the, the graph there on, the, on your left, s colonies greater than 75 centimeters are hit fairly hard by this colony, or the, this, this coral, which is the age of maturity. So it's effectively reducing the reproductive size of colonies below 70 meters. And if you look at the, the graph on the right, it, it predominantly inf affects uh, colonies between 70 and 110 meters. So the deeper range of this colony, which is not harvested by the fishers. The, har the fishers typically don't go below 70 meters. So therefore, we have what used to be thought of as a deep refugia now being impacted by an alien species. Uh, more, more recently, uh, Frank Parrish uh, put together a, um, a, a um, a uh, coalition of uh, catch data, and it shows that since 1985, there has been a dramatic increase in harvesting landings, actually even suppressing what, uh, what the suggested MSY should be. So basically, the threats to this resource have been a carriage oil invasion below 70 meters, harvesting pressure, and I should say an increasing harv harvesting pressure above 70 meters, resulting in a potential drop in recruitment. So we went out to, to collect more data to see where we find, and some of the methods that had been used in the past is basically a single tank divers went down at fairly deep depths to collect this data, very short bottom times. Later on, submersibles were used. However, it doesn't collect the right kind of data that, that is required for the resolution we need to look at. And more recently, we were using a, a, um, deeper uh, advanced diving technologies to get down there safely, reproduce the methods that, methods that were, uh, occurred in 1976. 
So from the data that, that Dr. Grigg collected and that I'm going to be showing you is basically age frequency uh, distributions. There's some assumptions I want to point out that, that to make this method work. First, we have to assume there's constant survival and mortality among all age classes. We think we fairly meet this, but I'll, I'll, there is a caveat. It's a fishery, so at a certain age, they are taken. So I'll, I'll split the data up to uh, account for that. Um, we have to assume there's constant recruitment for all age groups, and the sample is representative of the whole population. We think we meet these fairly well. Um, sorry for the formatting. Um, for the regression analysis, we'll basically take the, the, um, the log of the distribution to make it linear and then compare mortality rates. Um, we have to drop ages 0 and 1 because they're unrepresented in the population. They're too hard to see. Um, if age classes are missing individuals, we average that across two years. You can't take a, a log of a 0. Um, and regressions are only carried out across age classes that had continuous data. So if one population or one age group, excuse me, one time period had colonies up to age 26 and the other time period had colonies up to age 30, we would, we would stop at around age 26 to make a side-by-side -side comparison. So this is what we did. We uh, reinterpreted uh, Dr. Griggs' data in 1975 and 1998 and collected our own in 2004. So if we just briefly qualitatively look at this graph, we can see that maybe there's, there's a continuing decline in the larger colonies, but maybe there's also a decline in the juveniles as the 2001 data from the submersible suggested. Well, we want to look at this a little more. This is just qualitative. It doesn't actually give us any numbers to go on. So from that, we take a regression of the post-harvest um, colonies. Uh, the most important here you want to look at is uh, the numbers on the right. In 1975, the mortality was 17%. In 1998, it was almost 20%. And in 2004, it was over 30%. The important point here is, in a matter of 23 years, it increased by roughly 2%. Um, in six years, it increased over 10%. If we look at the pre-harvest, it's a little more complicated. Again, look at the numbers on the right. Um, mortality for, for pre-harvest colonies, 7%, 1998, it's about 9%. And in 2004, it says zero. Well, a 0% 0 mortality among juvenile colonies doesn't necessarily seem realistic. So based on this, we go back and, and reanalyze our assumptions. And if there has been a drop in recruitment, that would violate one of our assumptions. So we're basically looking at this and saying it may be that the recruitment has not been constant over this time period, and therefore we have had a drop in recruitment violating that assumption. Again, just to, to briefly summarize that, uh, repeat this graph, basically over 23 years there's been a 2.6% increase in mortality, but in six years there's been over 11% more, more, uh, increase in mortality in the post-harvest colonies. So another way to just briefly look at this is um, we don't have density data associated with this, but we can do it by effort of our bottom time, which is very closely tracked. And the, the important point here is if you look at the colonies under 9, but yet over 19, you can see in 2004 they are less than the years previous. But yet in those middle age classes, they're roughly about the same. So therefore, this population seems to be squeezed, not just from the fishing on the, on the larger colonies, but from the potential drop in recruitment in young col age classes. Uh, we don't have a, a comparison, a, a good comparison, and say, well, what is, uh, if, if you saw uh, uh, Ken Longnecker and Ross Langston's talk yesterday about looking at uh, uh, fish distributions in and out of marine reserves, we don't have that comparison here. But one close thing we do have is Kauai, which has not been harvested in, in over 30 years. And therefore, um, if we, we, what little we have on Kauai we take, therefore we can say, is Kauai representative? Well, Kauai has a lower mortality rate. I'll just throw the caveat here that um, th there's some the low R squared value in the Kauai data. We need to have a higher um, um, thing. So I'm actually running out of time, so I'm going to brush through the um, um, regulations here really fast. Currently, we're working on this. Uh, basically, where we're going right now is an increase in minimum size. Um, we want to create closed areas both on, on Kauai, Maui, and the Big Island. We want to create a fishery-specific permit, um, create new reporting requirements, particularly tracking of, of tag, uh, harvested colonies to get away, away from reporting discrepancies. Um, we also want to create a, a total allowable catch. And uh, eventually, we are discussing about limited op entry options. So I'll skip over the future work, but uh, there is a lot to be done, particularly with uh, reproductive work and genetic connectivity. And with that, I thank you very much.
papa na na to o hu e ho o hu i te ala o hi a o hu ka ni o hi a we hi wa no ho du a i o hu o hu mu hu mu ka wa hi ne no ho ma na o hu pa hi o i ka pa li ku ka wa ha wa ha pa li ku i ka pa ma ka ni ku ma ku a ha ka li ta o hu le wa i a e ka la wa e ha ka ano o le ke i a o hu no ke no ke ha ka la la ke ki a manu i ka o hu i ka o hi a ha ma u me ho o ha ma u i ta le o ka le hu a pa ne a pa ne mai pa hai ke i a ma mu e 